for our second gathering of the Roseville area advocates for a Minnesota health plan. My name is Connie Marty, and I'm one of a leadership team of four of us here in the area who have been uh, gathering and organizing these meetings. Uh, one is Mindy Briley, who will be speaking a little bit later, and Val Swenson back at the signing table, and Charlie Quick. So that's the leadership team here that's bringing this local, creating a local chapter here in the Roseville area for citizens to get involved in building a movement and awareness and education of what we can do together to bring single payer universal health care to Minnesota. So that's what our goal and mission is. And we are one chapter of a statewide organization called HCAM. Um, healthcare for all Minnesota, and uh, there are so there are local chapters all over the state of Minnesota rising up because we realize that citizen awareness and action and speaking out is what's going to bring change on the healthcare issue here in Minnesota. So um, what we're going to do tonight is uh, we have a speaker, Rose Roach, who I'll introduce in a moment. And after she's finished speaking, then Mindy Greiling will lead us in a conversation about what kind of actions can we take right here and now to make a difference. And then we'll, we'll close. So uh, I'd like to introduce Rose Roach, a good friend of mine. I've known her for a few years now. She is the executive director of the Minnesota Nurses Association, and we are so happy and excited to be with us tonight. She is a dynamic speaker on single payer health care plan. She is nationally, uh, she speaks all over the nation on this topic. She had, in August of 2016, she was named one of the top 100 most influential people in the healthcare area. And she is a top negotiator on labor, I can tell you that. And just passionate for single-payer health care justice for all of us. So welcome, Rose, and thank you for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you, Connie. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks, Connie, for inviting me to talk with you tonight. Uh, so um, I want to start out with a silly joke, OK? Because uh, sometimes they say you start off right with, to get everybody laughing. So when I, I worked for 11 years in California, born and raised here in Minnesota, went to California, worked out there for 11 years, came back to work for the nurses, did a lot of healthcare work out in, uh, healthcare policy work out in California as well. And uh, they thought I had an accent out there. <laughs> um, I don't know what they were talking about, because um, I certainly don't hear it, uh, but they hear the heavy Fargo, you know, type of accent um, when, when I speak. So a lot of times the way I started when I would go out and talk about uh, health care and single payer out there, I would start with an Oli joke. So, and I say, so Oli we worked in the fish factory up in Duluth, Minnesota. And uh, one day he had an accident. And in the accident, he lost all 10 of his fingers. So they rushed him to the hospital. And he gets into the emergency room. And the doctor says, well, Oli, oh my goodness. Where are the fingers? He said, well, what do you mean, where are the fingers? He says, well, nowadays you can put the fingers in, in a container with the ice and bring them in, and we could reattach them. And Ole looks at the doctor and says, well, how the heck are we supposed to pick them up? <laughs> <laughs> and that, to me, is a symbolic joke about this not-so-funny healthcare system. How are we supposed to pick up the fingers, right, um, once they come off of our hands? So first of all, greetings from your nurses. Um, the nurses absolutely believe that the only way that we can get to a health care system that actually provides health care for everybody is through a single payer system. They've been working on this for over 20 years. They were instrumental in bringing Minnesota care um, to Minnesota, and they are not stopping now. Now is our time, as a matter of fact, to move this issue on uh, both the state and the national level. So I know you were lucky enough at your first meeting to have the main man himself, um, <laughs> the author of the bill, the uh, you know activist, advocate extraordinaire, Senator John Marty here. So I don't want to repeat a lot of what he talked to you about, which is some specifics about the bill and, and how it's going to work. Uh, I'm going to focus a little more on just a tiny bit of history around healthcare reform. 
reform in this nation because uh, this isn't new. We've been trying to deal with making this system work for human beings for a really long time. Uh, then I'm going to go and uh, focus a little bit on providing some frontline perspective, meaning from the nurses' perspective, and that is on why the nurses are fighting for a sane, humane, patient-centered healthcare system, and what is wrong with the current system that is not any of those things that I just said, and how are we going to change the system? How are we going to make it happen? So with that, I'm going to get going. So the nurses, you know, endorsed this guy um, straight out of the shoot. Uh, that we were the first national union to endorse him. Um, and one of the things he said, and I think this sort of sums it up, right? People who can't afford health care do not deserve to die. I don't know how we can make it any clearer than that. And I think that's a good way to sort of set the table for this presentation. So a little bit of history. Um, I know this is a kind of a convoluted slide to some degree. I'm going to step back a little bit so that I can make sure everybody can see it. So um, as far back as 1915, there was a group called the American Association for Labor, and uh, they brought forth some legislation, labor law stuff, but it, it included actually health care insurance regulation and reform and compulsory health insurance for everybody. Uh, at the time that they brought that forward, um, it was they forged an alliance with many organizations, including the American Medical Association. Then World War I intervened. Uh, commercial insurance companies mounted a really powerful opposition to moving in that direction. So the AMA ended up changing their mind about how they felt about it, and everything ended in 1920 when the New York State Assembly killed the bill. Then you have Social Security. Social Security originally had basically Medicare for all in it, right? Um, the problem there was that uh, the insurance industry went a little nuts and didn't want it in there. And of course, the thought was, let's at least get the pension part of that passed. And so there was a sacrifice made. Stepped away from the health care uh, and then figured, well, we'll run that separately. You may not think that the Murray Wagner Dingle Bill, which is really about more about labor again than it is uh, necessarily about health care, but it actually did include a vehicle for national health insurance for everybody. Um, I, again, this one was backed by the CIO, not so much the AFL. <laughs> then when they got together, finally everybody got on board. Uh, but by the 40s, the AFL was in fact fully backing this as a solution to the issues uh, surrounding health care. And um, then we saw President Truman try to take this on, right, in the mid to late 40s, and unfortunately uh, was not able to get any movement on the national health uh, system. And even the Taft-Hartley Act, uh, again, Labor Act, that passed in 47, which really ended up destroying health trusts that were run by unions, because it brought in management on the other side, and suddenly everything became fairly convoluted, uh, and you started to see the, even the AMA weigh in on this idea and sending out a postcard saying that this will cause interference in the personal relationship of a doctor and patient. Taxes, bureaucracy, and of course, it's the same today, unfortunately. Um, so we then move into, you know, where we get Medicare and Medicaid. Then in the 60s, uh, you know, we, this is where we really entrench our employer-based system. Right, that you're going to get your health insurance and health care taken care of through your employer. And on top of that, you know, we are the only nation in the industrialized world that does that, by the way. And uh, then in 1973, up to 73, it was illegal to make a profit in health care. And then we have the passage, thanks to a guy named Kaiser from California and Mr. or President Nixon who got together and decided to create the, create the Health Maintenance Organization Act. And now it was okay to profit off of another person's suffering. Right. Um, then in the 80s, we start to see these you know, situations get even worse. Deregulation of the industry, the healthcare industry. Um, we start to see now the increases in the out-of-pocket costs that are hitting patients. Um, employees are paying more for their premiums out of their pocket. 
Wage stagnation is caused from this, right? Because you say, oh no, put it on my health benefits, I'll keep my wages flat because I don't want to pay more out of pocket for my health care premium. And that has caused wage stagnation for decades. Um, less dependent coverage, uh, you're seeing, of course, increases in uninsured and even more so in underinsured, which has become an even bigger problem right now, particularly under the Affordable Care Act. And then you start to see um, the profit motive starts to explode, right? This is when it really starts to happen. In comes the Clinton era. We see Hillary make an attempt in 1993-94 to do something about it. That doesn't go anywhere. And of course, in 2009-10, we see Obamacare or, or the Affordable Care Act uh, get passed. Uh, we now move into where we are now with, I don't know, repeal and replace, Trump care, there's, you know, lots of different um, names for it. Of course, that didn't pass, but we have that tax bill that did pass and get signed into law, which actually has uh, a, basically a repeal of, of many of the mandates um, under the Affordable Care Act. So this is nothing new in us trying to fix this system. Um, the ACA, <coughs> although did not do everything that it needed to do. Um, there were some things in there that moved us forward. And as um, Senator Marty said, and I think that this is really important, is the first time that we as a nation have made the commitment that everyone should have health care. Um, and I even had a doctor who wasn't necessarily a single payer supporter say to me, I think that the argument's over in this country about whether or not it's a right. I'm not sure that's entirely true. I think some people still don't see it that way, but um, I thought it was interesting for someone to come at it from that level and see the ACA is saying, we're not fighting about whether or not people should have health care anymore. They should. Now it's just how, really, it's how do we provide it. Uh, you know, going into the ACA, Minnesota had some of the lowest premium rates, you know, on our Minsure exchange. Um, we, of course, had Minnesota Care for the working poor, and we're able to maintain that, which is an incredibly important program. And uh, we already had in place some prohibitions on the health uh, insurance companies in relation to pre-existing conditions and discriminating against people. So we were a bit ahead of the curve, actually, here in Minnesota. Anybody remember this ad? Uh, I wasn't yeah. here at the time. <laughs> I was still in California when the AC was passed. Uh, but we put that up there because uh, there are, uh, you know, also there's some pretty serious deficiencies within the Affordable Care Act. And um, this apparently was Minsure's marketing campaign to get young invincibles uh, to sign up for health insurance. You know, this whole idea that, uh, you know, the more we have in the big pool, the better, right? Because uh, people will say to me, well, Medicare for all, I mean, Medicare is like really expensive. Yes, it's a pool of old sick people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all due respect, I'm turning 60 in a week, um, so I'm not that far from Medicare, but it is. I mean, and so of course the costs are higher because we use more health care as we age. And the whole point is if we can balance it out with the healthy, younger people, we will then begin to get some economic um, savings and some economic uh, scale to be able to control some costs. So um, other deficiencies, I mean, we saw out-of-pocket costs rise. We didn't do anything about the administrative waste that um, exists within the system. Uh, and it really has caused coverage to become unaffordable for many, many um, citizens. And um, I would just offer that really the biggest flaw is that we maintained a private insurance system overall. Uh, you know, so now we're dealing with networks and, uh, you know, and then the gaps in the coverage that's provided. And finances continues to be the number one barrier to people when it comes to accessing care. It is the cost right up front. Um, complexity. We, we keep adding layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy and administrative, uh, you know, burdens. And that creates more complexity and that creates more cost. I mean, we're going in the opposite direction in regards to costs on that. And of course, we still have millions that are remaining uninsured. And speaking of costs, a um, couple of questions for you. So what percentage of bankruptcies in the U.S. are due to medical debt? And nobody from Age Camp can answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> A lot. Any idea? 
So it's 66% of all bankruptcies in this country are filed because of medical debt. And you should know that again, one of the, one of the um, you know, exceptionalisms for us is that we're the only country where anybody files goes bankrupt over being ill. Okay? So next question, what percent of those bankrupt Americans had health insurance? It's 75%. So this isn't even the uninsured we're talking about here. This is people who had insurance and still ended up having to file for bankruptcy due to medical debt. Can I ask a question? Sure. Let me give you the numbers. I worked for a bankruptcy law firm, and believe me, I know you say I'm not insured, but 66% is way too much. Um, we're seeing, you know, have problems with credit card debt and big cars they can't afford. And we're actually seeing a lot of credit card debt is due to people putting their medical debt onto credit cards. Mm -hmm. yes. A huge percentage of credit card debt. And I'm sorry that I don't have the source reference here. That's a, thank you for pointing that out. I will get the source because we've sourced all of this. We normally do put it on a slide. Yeah, and the reason, that, sure, I will get that you know, for you. I, I work in bankruptcy all the time. And I see these lists of creditors and I don't know what it looks like. Sure. No, it's a valid question. I'm just grabbing a pen because whenever I get asked a question that I can't answer right off the top of my head, um, trust me, I will and see me afterwards so I can get an email or something for you and I will let you know. So. Oh, no, no, you are absolutely right. And, and when I, as soon as you said that, I looked down and went, uh oh, we forgot the source on this one because we normally do source. Our statistics. So I apologize that for some reason. Well, oh, we, absolutely. And people go bankrupt for reasons other than, and some of them are unfortunately irresponsible. I, I'm not saying that, but um, but in this country, and that that statistic has been there and has stayed at that for a number of years. It was pre-ACA, and it didn't get fixed very much post-ACA. So that's been a fairly stagnant number. I just don't remember the source, but I will get it for you for sure. And the last question, what percentage of every health care dollar spent on administration? And this isn't just the health insurance companies. This is total administration. Yes. It's as a percent. It's 33%. So 33 cents of every dollar is not going to health care. Okay? It's going to something else. You know, hospitals have a huge billing department. They have, sometimes it feels like more in the billing department than they have nurses on the floor, right? Because they have to, you know, well, is it Blue Cross? Is it Medica? Is it United? Is it Sigma? Is it Aetna? Right? And then which plan is it within there? And do you have a copay? Do you have a deductible? I mean, all that stuff has to get sorted out. That starts to layer on and on and on in regards to administrative costs. So I'm going to put this out so I don't forget that one. <laughs> um, so what about workers? So particularly from a labor union perspective, since the nurses, uh, Minnesota Nurse Association is in fact a labor union. Oh, yes. Uh, in that figure, are you including things like prior authorization? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, all of that. It, that's exactly right. Yes, that prior authorization stuff, all of that is included in that administrative cost. And some studies have even said it's getting closer to 40% now, right? Um, so labor, this has been the number one issue at the bargaining table for many years for any of us who are organized into a collective bargaining agreement. Um, we fight with each other, with management and labor, over the cost. Really, it's just about who's going to pay it. We never talk about the fact we might have actually a common enemy um, that's coming after both of us, right? Uh, and so we still, as I said, have mostly an employer-based system in which we get uh, access to health insurance. And then you can see the others is through their government programs or doing direct purchasing like through Minsure on the individual market um, or being just simply uninsured. And as I said earlier, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is um, workers have been giving up a lot in wages or any other type of benefits, sometimes contributions to pensions, anything like that, simply so they could balance out and not have such a heavy hit in their paycheck for their insurance premiums. Um, 
And, you know, it really is true that we are at the point where it's a failed strategy to think we can bargain over this issue anymore, which is why many of labor, not all, nurses are working on it, um, have, I think it's finally recognized that we have to move this off of the bargaining table and have it be a public good, right? That's what we really need to move towards. Um, you can see here where this is what makes it unsustainable. You have overall inflation is the gray, the light blue is work, uh, workers' earnings, the darker blue is workers' contributions to premiums, and then health insurance premium increases themselves. That alligator mouth <laughs> is not sustainable. It's not sustainable for workers, it's not sustainable for businesses, it's not sustainable for government, it's not sustainable for families. That's why we have to fix it. And I can't not say a word about these folks. Um, <laughs> Big Pharma, you know, is a bit of a problem in our system. And I just want to provide this particular slide because they also do good stuff, right? At least they provide something that helps us, you know, for the most part. Um, they have some caveats to that as well. Uh, but we often hear that the reason the drugs cost so much is because they have to do research and development. They're constantly creating these new, fabulous, wonderful drugs. Me? Mm -hmm. you know, they got that patent thing going on where they change a molecule at the end of their patent and they get their patent extended. And then they jack the price up. The reality is, is they're spending way more on advertising those drugs to us and, um, and also uh, for their congressional, you know, to get the lobbyists to do like what they did in 2003 in the middle of the night in Medicar Medicare Part D and make sure that the government can't negotiate with pharmaceutical companies over the bulk purchasing of drugs for Medicare recipients. Yes, sir. I also wanted to point out that the research and development is actually done in universities. That's right. Tax, taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the companies actually aren't spending anything on creating the drugs. It's very, very little. They do a little, but it's very, very little. And you were right. We are already paying for that through the taxes we pay in the universities because that's where most of the research and development is actually done in this country. So, yes, Paul? Uh, can you convert that 180 million to the same metric? Oh, I, me right off the top of my head, no, but we could probably do that math <laughs> just to see what it's, yeah. They're, um, they're pretty powerful up there on the hill, right? I mean, there was Billy Towson, right? He was, the, uh, he was a rep house, in the House of Representatives, I believe, the leader of getting that piece I just talked about in the Medicare bill, said, make sure there was no negotiation that could happen. And um, I don't know, it wasn't very long after he passed that bill that he went to work for Big Pharma and continues to make a lot of money um, as a lobbyist now. So, overall, the consequences of, of the Affordable Care Act um, really are just a continued reliance on uh, private insurance. We're still employment-based. You know, this idea of market competition, I don't even know what that means in healthcare. I've always wondered, can we just bring everybody in the room from the insurance companies and see who wants to get on the brain tumor versus the lung, you know, the transplant? <laughs> what are we talking about? Right? Competition in healthcare, it doesn't work that way. It's our health. It's not a consumable good. You don't go buy up a little bit of health here and there and take it home for a while. We are human. We are all going to be sick at some point or injured. It is really in our public health interest to make sure that everybody in this room is safe and it doesn't have TB and walking around because we've now all been exposed to it if they do. That just doesn't make good sense and it doesn't make good financial sense either. Um, there's no real proven cost containment. Uh, in the Affordable Care Act. We don't negotiate for bulk uh, purchasing of drugs in that one either. And we just haven't changed how we pay for health care. Uh, they're trying to make some changes in that, and that's making things actually worse and not better. So I do want to just read the one quote that's on the side there from Alex McGillis. Uh, he's a Washington Post writer. He wrote this in October of 2010. He said, the Democrats' effort to sell the law to the public may be undermined by what even some ardent supporters consider its biggest shortfall. The overhaul left virtually untouched one big element of our health care dilemma. 
the price problem. There is no government single payer on the other side of the table. The 2010 law does little to address this. Its many cost control provisions are geared toward reducing the amount of care we consume, not the price we pay. The main reason for this is politics. So there was no price fight. It is one of those fine political ironies. The law derided as socialism may have had an easier time winning favor from a skeptical public if it was, well, a little more socialist. <laughs> and I think that that is a good way to uh, sum that up. So a lot of times um, I end up in my role, both uh, with mostly within labor, I end up in the room with the industry somewhere, whatever the industry might be. And particularly if we're at the bargaining table, a lot of times it's with insurance agents or whatever. And particularly back in, in California, I happen to represent school employees. So it wasn't teachers, but it was the food service workers and the secretaries and the bus drivers, right, and the custodians. Um, and they would always bring in this really, usually very young, very blonde, very attractive women who would sit down with a really pretty glossy document to tell us why they had it, in this particular school district, increase the rates by 64% in one year. 64%. <clears throat> Now, um, the type of worker I represent is referred to as a classified school employee, and um, they are, needless to say, probably some of the lesser paid of all the employees in the school district. And um, I was sitting next to um, a paraeducator who happened to come from England, so she sort of um, gets how we should do health care, and uh, she uh, was going to be working well past her retirement age because she's basically providing health care for her and her husband. Uh, by working, and she was going to pay $1,800 a month um, for health care out of this, uh, you know, this proposal. And when you ask them, well, why does it have to go up 64%, right? Why does it have to go up that much money? We're basically told, well, it's your fault, huh? Right? It's your fault because you're using it. <laughs> That's number one. We used it. Utilization. Well, I thought that's why I bought it. Right in the first place was so I could use it. Um, so you know your your lifestyle. You don't eat enough fruit. You don't exercise. Um, you uh, you know you smoke too much. You drink too much. Um, you're old. Right. This population is old. That's why the costs are so high. Uh, also, you're you're going to the doctor all the time for everything. Right, because who doesn't want to just pop in the doctor's office for a colonoscopy on a Friday off? <laughs> what kind of nonsense? I mean, really, but this is what we get. This is what we get. Um, we're being, in, you know, irresponsible. And, of course, new technology. We're always told that a lot of the money goes towards new technology. Well, I'm here to tell you um, that that's not true. Um, you know, it's not that we couldn't do a little better on some of those things. I'm not saying that. Of course we could. But are they major cost drivers in this system? Absolutely not. So I'm going to become the ugly chart lady for a couple minutes um, and go through some charts. And they're really for impact more than anything else. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them. But you'll get the idea. So we're old? Well, wait a minute. Well, we compare our, you know, like a percent of our population age uh, as the elderly, as, or excuse me, the elderly as a percent of our population, and we compare it to the other countries that provide at least some level of health care as an actual right for their citizens, where do we fall? No, it isn't about age. So here is percent of population ages 15 that smoke daily when you compare us to the other industrialized nations that provide some level of health care as a right. And if I had put the drinking one up there, it's almost identical to the smoking one. So it isn't about our drinking and our smoking and our being old, right? Now, obesity is a problem in this country. That is true. Um, but that could be its own presentation. Because obesity is not just about everybody being careless and you know having Coca-Cola every day and eating the Oreos. It's absolutely directly tied to one major thing, which is poverty. You go into a heavily, uh, to a neighborhood that is destitute with poverty and you try to find a farmer's market. But what will you find on every other corner? Taco Bell, McDonald's, 99 cents for a hamburger, 6.99 for a salad. Right? 
I mean, it's systemic and it's way bigger than just saying, you know, eat better. <laughs> way, way better. Way, way, way different. So, um, how often do we go to the doctor compared to those other, other nations? We're not running to the doctor. We don't stay in the hospital longer than they do. We're pushed out way sooner than most of the other industrialized nations. So these types of things that you constantly hear the industry say, saying are the reasons the costs are high, the statistics just don't bear that out. Uh, this will show you, and I think this you already know, I'm sure that the senator touched on this, the fact that you know we're paying a lot of money in this country for health care, not everybody is covered by that health care. And of that $8,745, you know, that's per person in this country, man, woman, child. But not every man, woman, child is covered. But that is the cost. Mm -hmm. And of that, about 65% of that is public money already. <laughs> so we're practically paying for it. We're just saying, get it. Yeah. Right? Um, and you can see how these other nations do it in some way, shape, or form, they do it better, with better health outcomes, better um, life expectancy uh, statistics than we do, and they do it at a cheaper cost. And here's the life expectancy of the United States compared to these other industrialized nations. So we don't live as long. And this one is pretty stunning to me. Um, maternal mortality. You can see we are Unfortunately, I don't know if you want to read it at the bottom or the top, but um, women in the United States are more likely to die during childbirth than women in any other developed country. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure that we do. I do know that 36 deaths per 100,000 live births for a black woman. So black women have tripled the rate of maternal mortality than a white woman does. So there's also, there's absolutely racial disparities in our healthcare system. There's no question about that. Uh, women with low incomes or in rural areas are also at higher risk, of course, of death after giving birth. And there are, um, and although there are many reasons for maternal uh, uh, mortality rates, our fragmented system and the way it operates contributes to it. There's no getting around that. And then equally as disturbing, is the fact that in the richest nation in the world, the United States has the highest, higher, has a higher rate of infant mortality than the entire list of these other industrialized nations. One infant mortality rate is almost three times that of Finland and Japan and twice that of most of the other industrialized nations that are on this graph. When you say infant or age group? Yeah, um, you know, I, this is another one where I should have had that clarified. And the reason why I'm saying that is because um, I do this presentation on women and health equity up at St. Kate's mm -hmm. for the physician assistant um, program up there. And they had asked me uh, about that because I'm not myself a nurse, by the way. I'm a trade unionist. <laughs> um, and so I, my head doesn't go to that kind yeah. of a question to say define it because I know there's a nurse, for sure one nurse in the, <laughs> in the audience anyway. Um, and, and there is a range that is uh, how they define infant, and I, I don't know that answer right off the top of my head either. And I don't know if you know or anything for this statistic. Oh, I... Usually, it's usually under a year. It's usually under... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, great. Another healthcare professional or a nurse or a Okay. Under a year. So, say a lot of them are yeah, there's, some, there's something, to, and that goes back to sort of, you know, how, you know, the, uh, the lack of, like, prenatal mm -hmm. care that we give to, like, again, you've got to be able to access the system mm -hmm. to get prenatal mm -hmm. care so that you have a healthy baby and don't have the baby prematurely and things of that nature, yeah. but we have barriers to that care. Yeah, and I understand that. That's yeah. why I'm wondering if you go to Japan, do they consider infant zero to one? I believe that these are all adjusted so that you're looking at the same, the same yes, okay. yes, yes. That, that I'm sure. Okay. Yes, yep. Um, One of the reactions I get to that is that we have such advanced technology, we're trying to save baby baby, mm -hmm. and that's why our... But these aren't. I don't know what I have. Um, it's, I mean, I, mean, I think that's absurd. They, they do know. a lot of risk adjustment with any of these types of statistics. So, in effect, 
that shouldn't be the thing that plays in here and throws this out of right. the same Right, because you right, exactly. Or That's we, how you want to give birth to like more than two or three babies mm -hmm. more than other countries do. Um, oh, if we, we are a country that gives birth more often, multiple oh. children, like three, four, five, six, because of intravenous. Oh, I see what you're saying, like multiple birth. births. Yeah, multiple You're saying births. that kind of thing? I just, that's another thing. I, I, again, I don't about. think so. I think. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a question. I mean, most of these nations, too, though, they do provide free prenatal right. and maternal care. And that makes a difference. So even if it was a multiple birth or whatever, if you can access that care, you at least have a better chance. And yes. in addition, mm -hmm. they allow a birthing parent to take time off of the baby for how much longer. <laughs> and right. that was a guarantee of job in the United States. You don't get that. Right. So you, don't want, you know, so you have a whole different. Exactly. The presentation I do on women and health equity speaks to that issue that health uh, is more than just literally the doctor's office, right? It is being able to stay home and take care of yourself or a loved one and not lose your job. Right? Just the stress of that caretaking and worrying about those things can impact our health as well. Yes, ma'am. Well, here's another tidbit of food for thought. I heard a lengthy discussion not more than a few weeks ago about um, the fact that black women are more, well, probably any woman of color, but black in particular, live with so much stress that their bodies are older yes. than white women's bodies. And right. so that's why their infants are at higher risk. Sure. And yeah. so it's just, you know, it's right. something, I mean, how many of us would think of that? Yeah. You know? No, exactly. And, you know, a single-payer system doesn't in and of itself wipe out all problems within the system, whether it's deli delivery, you know, the delivery part of the system, or even the inequities that exist. But it sure starts to tip that balance in the right direction. It's the first thing we have to start to do to get to some of that other stuff. Because as I said, the number one barrier being the cost factor in financial prevents you from even getting to these other issues a lot of times. So um, it's really about people's lives, right? That's what it comes down to. So two quick stories um, from nurses. The president of m &A tells a story. She's an ICU nurse at North Memorial Hospital in Robbinsdale. And she tells a story about being in the ICU one weekend, and she has two patients, and they're both diabetics. And they're in there because they didn't have to take their insulin. And she asked one of them, what's the deal? They were intubated, right, for a period of time. And when they were not, when he wasn't anymore, she said, you know, what happened? And he said, you know, I uh, simply can't afford my insulin, right? Insulin about 700 bucks a month, $15,000 a day to be in the ICU and intubated. The other gentleman said, well, I have my insulin, but my son is diabetic, and he can't afford his, so I split mine. Right? So we are right back to this situation where we are penny wise and pound foolish in the way that we do healthcare in this country. Um, Seven hundred dollars versus fifteen thousand. What? You know what? It doesn't make any sense. And the other story. Uh, we just managed to get passed at the National AFL-CIO Convention in October a resolution supporting Medicare for All and getting labor to stand behind that and work towards it and put some resources into it. And when that debate was happening on that resolution on the floor, a nurse from uh, Washington, D.C., Sandra Falwell, she's the president of the D.C. Nurses Association and a member of our National Nurses United, and she told a story. She's a, a neonatal nurse in D.C., at Children's DC, and she said little Tiger was born, he was a premature baby, he was born at one pound seven ounces. His parents had, or they thought they had, wonderful insurance. Uh, their middle class family doing everything they should, paying for their insurance. At one and a half months, he was growing, um, he was thriving, but the insurance company decided that Children's Hospital was just too expensive. <coughs> so that he should be taken out of that hospital and put into a different hospital. 
Well, the parents checked out the other hospital only to find out that other hospital didn't have the right resources that were necessary to keep Little Tiger continuing to thrive and to grow. So they took out a second mortgage to pay cash so that their little child could stay, baby, could stay at Children's Hospital and get the care that he needed. Well, two months later, Little Tiger got to go home. Now he was still had um, he was still uh, had a ventilator, and so he needed special care around the clock. And his mother quit her job to stay home with him, uh, but it's pretty hard to do that 24/7. So they asked their insurance company for some nursing help to come in. He needed, you know, the the uh, ventilator needed to be cleaned out and things every four hours, I believe it was, and they would give them a nurse for four hours a week that they would pay for. So um, the so this couple, these parents, found some folks, some people to come in and help. They were not nurses, they were not RNs, but that could just help them balance out, you know, what became pretty tough for them to do. And uh, one day, Sandra, the nurse, got a call that little Tiger was in the emergency room, and by the time she got down there, she knew that he was gone because he had a clogged a clog in the ventilator in the trach from the tracheotomy and uh, the person who was caring for him didn't know what to do. And so the baby died, and these parents came up to her and said, what did we do wrong? We did everything we were supposed to do. We paid our insurance premiums, and this is not how this should have turned out. Those are real life stories that are going on right now in this country. That's not years ago, that's just within the last six to eight months. So I would say this, um, what do we do? We move to single payer, we understand it, we talk about it as an investment model. It's an investment model of, of healthcare. And that means, you know, it's basic, right? 101, paid for from taxes like libraries, roads, education, healthcare is seamless, you see the doctor you want, everyone's health is treated equally, and it is one sign of a humanistic, society, no profiting off of people's health. Um, and it assumes health as a, I said earlier, as a, um, actually as a good, as a public good. So here in Minnesota, you know, where it's next, um, <laughs> we, uh, we can go ahead and ask for some waivers. I'm sure, again, that the Senator talked a little bit about that from the federal government under the Affordable Care Act. We can seek some waivers to innovate and try to do um, single payer on a statewide level. Uh, we're going to have to pass legislation no matter what, so that's kind of a bottom line, right? But that's not going to happen without a movement behind it. That's for darn sure. Um, we should probably assume that the Veterans Administration and, um, and Medicare are not going to be allowed to combine in with our state plan, but I'll take it. If, if we got Medicare over here, and we've got the vets taken care of over here, and all the rest of us are in this, and that has no insurance companies involved in it, I'm good. Uh, so we are continuing to explore options to see if there's a way to involve um, those, or to combine those, that money all together. And I would just mention that another side to this, in case John didn't mention it earlier, is you know the issue of health care within the workers' comp system which could be really a wonderful plus for businesses, because that's the biggest portion of what businesses pay within the workers' comp is about the medical costs for that. Just think if they didn't have to worry about that, because employees many times are accessing the comp system because they don't have access to a healthcare system on their own end. And so this could really help with um, businesses on workers' comp costs potentially as well. It's something for us to at least explore and think, think about. So you already know all the wonderful things about the Minnesota Health Plan. covers everything medically necessary, including long-term care and dental care. Restores the medical decisions to medical professionals. Wouldn't that be nice, right? Um, I had a dislocated uh, disc in my jaw, and they um, didn't want to pay for me to get uh, just a mouth guard that helped slip it back in uh, because they reviewed it and didn't know if it was medically necess necessary. And I said, who reviewed it? And they said, what? <laughs> I said, who made this decision? Because I was just, like, I bought an all eyeball with a doctor who saw, was looking at an MRI of my jaw and made this decision. Who made, who, who are you talking about? Well, I don't know. I, I said, are there doctors and nurses and radiologists on this group that made this decision? Well, 
well, I'm not sure. I said, well, I'm pretty sure. I know. And they're bean counters, and they're not medical <laughs> professionals. You know, and how dare you tell me that I can't have what, you know, the doctor said I needed, right? Yes. <coughs> oh, yeah, I know it is. That's, that's a mild thing. Yeah, it's low paid employees with high school degrees, yeah. maybe, um, maybe not even in this country, that sure. are making decisions based on some computer. Right, yeah. right. It's I worked pretty in that crazy. Environment for two years, and the most horrible experience of my life. Right. <laughs> so, um, again, you get choice. I always laugh when people say, oh my gosh, me, I mean, I don't want to lose the choice, the, cho um, the freedom to choose my you know, doctor. You get freedom. I don't have any freedom. I get to look. Yeah. Every year that tells me who I get to go to and who I don't. Mm -hmm. That's not freedom. What are you talking about? We're talking about go to the one down the street or go to the one 50 miles away, whatever you want to do, just go. Um, you know, takes the private corporations out and is, of course, progressively funded. So we could all, a couple things we can do. We could conduct a study. We've been working, the nurses work very closely with Senator Marty on a lot of legislative um, efforts around health care. And one of the things we'd love to see is the governor, he did it a few years ago. We'd like to see him do it again, put some money into his budget to fund a study. So, we, you know, fine. You want to, you know, if, if folks think that this isn't the way to go, we should go even more market-based, great. Let's study a market, fully market-based system, an in-between system, and a single-payer system, and let the chips fall where they may. I'm confident on that one. Because every study that's ever been done on this type of system has shown it saves money, it improves quality, and it saves people's lives. Every single one. Um, so bring it on. So the other things we could be doing is we can think about using Minnesota Care and medical assistance to get the HMOs and the insurance companies out of our public uh, pro, uh, health care programs, right? Let's make them those accountable to us. Let's expand those programs' eligibility as a way to start to build the infrastructure to move everybody eventually into a full single payer system and then get rid of this crazy prepaid, it's called the PMAP, Prepaid Medical Assistance Program. That was a pilot program. John talks about this often. That started, I don't know, 30 years ago. It's a pilot program. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we've got a few other states that have some innovative ideas. They've done uh, in Montana, nonetheless, they've done free primary care for 11,000 state employees and their dependents. Right? I mean, primary care, we, we don't do enough on the end of like prevention, right? We're more of a sick care system than a health care system. And uh, also in Oklahoma and Connecticut, and again, Senator Marty has a bill called Primary Care Case Management Bill, uh, and this would help us put the emphasis on that upfront care. Let's pay for that care on the front end so we don't have the high costs on the back end. So again, it's getting the insurance companies out and, and focusing on primary care coordination. Do you have any data on the uh, on Connecticut, the cost savings that they realized when they got rid of the insurance um, companies? I'm just, just trying to see here. I don't have the um, numbers offhand, but. Yeah, um, Connecticut is what you I'm trying to look at some of this. Medicare, people who know Medicare and control, $150 billion. I didn't want to have to get into too much of the, um, the exact right, on like, some of this. I'm just, right. I'm just trying to see whether or not they said uh, they saved an average. I, it doesn't have a hard number in here, but I'm sure we can find out. I know that they have, I mean, you know, Oklahoma isn't exactly a vividly blue state or anything, and they were like, something's wrong here, right? We're being ripped off. And uh, they, they absolutely did uh, save money, and I, we, we can get those statistics, but the, those programs are really working pretty well. Okay, in both Oklahoma and in Connecticut. So just some ideas from other states. So you hear a lot about a public option. Why don't we just do a public option? Um, you know, I just want to just caution everybody a little bit about that because if you're just going to throw another program amongst all of the existing programs, then you just put another program amongst all the other programs, okay? And if we manage to figure out how to do it from a government perspective, and, and let's say we can keep that premium down a little bit, who do you suppose is going to buy that plan? Probably the people that's sick. Right? I mean, the people that need it most will go into that pool, and then what do we end up with in that pool? People that are utilizing more health care because they need to. I'm not blaming them. It's just it makes sense. And then what's going to happen eventually? It, it's just, you know, so either the state will have to behave like an insurance company, and we'll go right back to, you know, networks and higher deductibles and, yeah, managed care, all that kind of stuff. 
uh, you know, or they're just going to have to understand they're going to just keep paying more and more and more and more. Yes. Isn't that essentially what we have with the fee for service option and the HMO? And only you don't have a choice. Well, yeah, within the, the on Medicaid or right. Um, yeah, you don't necessarily know which of those two systems you're in, right? Under the Medicaid program, under medical assistance, well, because some of them are fee for service, but some of them are HMO because you're put well, into an HMO. Yeah, but generally, more higher service patients are in the fee for service. So the state gets up the cost, the higher cost. Right. Already. Because right. we don't, the insurance yeah, companies can't else possibly else do that because they're losing money, as they said, on two point three billion dollars in right. reserves. Um, so okay. Okay. we really, if we were to go into something that says, let's take and pay X amount of dollars for to take care of Rose on her primary care, but then if I'm diagnosed with cancer, then we switch to fee for service in order to deal with whatever you know that additional illness is we could start to get some control over costs. But we don't do that. And we're all over the place. It's just a hodgepodge. So the public, uh, public option is not necessarily something that's gonna work within the system. So just to let you know, we got a, uh, you know, we got an election year this year. In case you didn't hear. <laughs> um, and it's gonna be kinda important around this issue. Um, particularly for the governor's seat um, and of course, um, trying to move something in DC is probably not going to happen for a few more years. But we could at least start to put some building blocks in place if we get the right person into the governor's seat, and we make sure that they are willing to sign a, a law. But not only that, but they're actually campaigning on this issue, and they believe in it, and they are laying out what the game plan is. It has to be part of their vision. And of course, on the national level, uh, we're going to put forward the bill. Oops, I'm sorry. And um, and Senator Franken was on the bill, and so we've got to just convince um, you know Senator Franken <coughs> to get on the bill as well. Yes. So I've got a question rolled sure. about this presentation. Uh, is this on the M and A website somewhere? How can we so we can share with other sure. other folks? Because this is the first meeting I've been. So. Oh, okay. Um, I, I mean, I can figure out how to make it accessible. We don't. I don't think we have it on the M and A website at the moment. This is the first time I've ever done this one. Um, so I'm learning some things from you guys. You're teaching me a little bit of guinea pigs and all. So um, I'd like but, to say to you that we're videotaping this and we're going to make it available on YouTube, and we'll give everybody the link to it if you give us your email. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, anyways, Bernie's got a national bill. That's a good thing. Um, and just a couple words about uh, you know how do you start a conversation on this issue? Really, youth values. We don't talk enough from a place of value. I think we go right to like the end, you know, the bottom line or the end game. If you talk to somebody, and, and I've been in rooms where folks are maybe a little more conservative and concerned about sort of the theory of government takeover of our health care and things of that nature. And when I start to ask them, you know, do you think that, you know, health care should be in the hands of health care professionals instead of, you know, insurance people? You know, most of them think, yeah, of course, it should be between me and my doctor, right? Do you think someone should profit off another human being who's suffering? Um, you know, most people will say no. Nobody should do that. I mean, I had one senator tell me he thought that it should. Um, and uh, <laughs> turns out he sold uh, health insurance. But um, he, uh, when, when he said that, he said because he thought people should be paid for providing health care. And I said, well, Senator, I'm a trade unionist sit next to a nurse, she provides health care. I have no problem with making sure she's paid very well for taking care of me. Tell me, who did Stephen Hemsley heal for $66 million? Mm -hmm. He's the head of United Healthcare, in case you don't know who he is. And he just looked at me, and seriously, this is what he did. Mm. <laughs> he didn't answer my question. So, um, but start with some values and stories. You know, stories move people, right? And unfortunately, almost all of us, if we don't have a personal health care story, we probably have a loved one that has one or a friend. Um, and find some common ground in that way. I know at Isaiah we work with, and they, they've started the conversation by saying, um, so who do you know that is dealing, or, or are you yourself dealing with this system right now because you're ill, have, have a um, health issue? And how is the system? impacting that illness and that suffering. And that's a good way to start to think about talking with people about it. 
Um, I thought that this was a good slide. I dug it up just recently. It was adopted from Nathan Wilkes. And you can see here, what he's saying is that if progressives, you know, some of the things that progressives will like to hear about this is it's a human right, it's universal, comprehensive, it's about public health, and eliminates financial barriers to care. Conservatives, on the other hand, you know, they do care about a doctor-patient relationship and what that means. Um, it, it spurs entrepreneurship when you don't have this heavy burden of this particular uh, balance sheet item. Um, it does lower costs. Uh, it, you know, we're talking about publicly financing but privately delivering so that the docs and the hospitals, everything are still private sector. And, so, and it certainly is supportive of small businesses, without a doubt. And uh, we also have found out that although a lot of times conservatives don't see it as a right, they do see it as a necessity as a human necessity because we are human, right? So uh, independence, you know, minimal federal intervention we're talking about here and, and it eliminates the corporate profiteering. So those are just some things that are kind of food for thought. Um, just so you know what the nurses are up to, lots of stuff. Uh, we've taken on labor, progressive groups, health organizations, farmers, um, faith groups. We're working with all of them to try to move this. Uh, communities of color we're getting into to talk about the impact on them. We're trying to use evidence-based messaging. We're going out actually all throughout the state week after next to find out how people feel about this, what kind of messaging works when we talk about um, a universal health care system or single payer. And um, we know that it's going to take a strong coalition of people so the nurses can't do it alone. So what can you do? Oops, I'm sorry. Talk to your, geez, I went too fast. Talk to your legislators. Invite me to speak to a group if you'd like me to. I'm happy to come out anywhere if there's another group besides this one. Um, host a house party. If you're a nurse, talk to us at m &A. If you're a physician or a physician assistant or a radiologist or technologist, uh, excuse me, a technician, talk to PNHP. Land Stewardship is doing some amazing work with our farmers and our rural communities on this issue. Isaiah, if uh, you're within the faith community, the Main Street Alliance, I'm doing a round table with them next week actually, a bunch of small businesses that are convinced this is the only way to save their business. Um, and of course, Healthcare for All or Take Action, both of them are working with the general public on this. So there's a place for you no matter where you um, fall into this. So just bottom line, it, it's up to us, right? Do we want to keep nibbling around the edges of a failed system? Or as Paul said, you know, Wellstone, um, do we want, what he said was significant social change comes from the bottom up from an aroused opinion that forces our ruling institutions to do the right thing. And that's the truth. So I don't know who you trust versus who I trust, but I know which <laughs> side of the uh, aisle I'm on here, and I'm going with the scrubs. Um, because, you know, the health insurance industry, it's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, and it answers to its shareholders. Nurses answer to their patients and to their community. They know what it takes to fix this system, and they're saying it's single payer. <laughs> I believe HCAM also, did you guys do a response to Jensen's? I can't remember. I think I it was, okay, uh, I there could remember. There were several letters written, I think. Right. All the letter. yeah. Yes, there was some recent ones just that Ron had sent out this week, actually, that posted over the weekend yeah. in response to um, Senator Jensen's claims. Uh, and, uh, but seriously, um, once we saw that Senator Marty was going to take it on, we just felt we didn't need to because it was, you know, the two senators, and he, you know, he's just so articulate on this issue, he was able to just peel that onion and go point by point by point. Um, so we just, in that particular case, we chose not to. We have, however, absolutely responded to some of those public types of, um, I don't know, it sort of feels like it's kind of propaganda-ish or whatever, and we've come at it, and we've tried to get our counterpoint in. Sometimes we make it, sometimes we don't. You know, the, the, the newspapers choose, <laughs> not us, but we certainly try. I've been on NPR talking about this 
Um, I've done national radio shows about this. The nurses have got a couple of nurse-specific channels uh, that they like to talk about this on. So we're trying to get into every medium we can. And we are going to spend some serious money, the nurses will, on some like, I know it sounds a little crazy, but Facebook ads and things like that that get people's attention um, to start talking about it. So we're going to use social media and all the different tools we have available to really build this movement. Yes. When will the nurses endorse for Minnesota Governor? And we have. Okay. Oh, oh. The nurses endorse Aaron Murray. Oh, I didn't Yes. Okay. yes. Aaron uh, is a nurse. Okay. And, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that helps, I guess. Um, but that wasn't the only criteria. Um, I want to be clear about that. But um, Aaron is out talking about this issue on the campaign trail. And she has laid out a vision for how we get there and a plan. So she's not just like saying the words. She's actually got it as part of her campaign platform, so um, the nurses endorsed Aaron in September.